Well, good morning, Parkway. Hey, I have a question for you. Have you ever heard of this phrase, and we all have, we've heard this before, rules are meant to be broken. We've heard this before? Okay, now, when some of you hear that, some of you are like me, are naturally a rule follower, right? Like our teachers loved us growing up. Um, our parents could actually take us places when we were growing up. Um, our, empl- our employers, our bosses, they love us because we're just such good employees because we just follow the rules and we just do what's asked of us, right? Some of you, like me, some of us, we're just naturally rule followers. Now, some of you, some of us, um, are none of those things. Right? We would consider ourselves naturally more of a rule breaker. Any rule breakers in the room? A few? Okay, of course you're not raising your hand. You're not going to do what you're asked, right? Because you're a rule breaker. Right? So some of us are naturally rule breakers. Like we'll take our policies and procedures handbook and we just throw it away because we don't need it because we're rule, we're rule breakers. Well, hey, actually, if you're a rule breaker, you're actually, we're actually going to love this series because we're going to see that Jesus himself was somewhat of a rule breaker. See, we're starting the series called Unruly, and in this series, we're going to see that Jesus is going to show us how to break the rules so they don't break us. But the question is, what rules did Jesus break, right? Was Jesus just breaking all the rules? Well, the rules that Jesus breaks were actually a bunch of extra cultural rules completely made up by a group of people called the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees were people in positions of religious leadership. They viewed themselves as the professional rule keepers, right? And with these extra rules that they created, they actually ended up twisting and distorting um, Scripture and God's original design to be, to be able to keep themselves in power and to be able to keep other people from God. See, there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Maybe you knew this before. There's 613. 13 commandments. And you know what the Pharisees said? That's not enough. And they added even more. They added more rules uh, to twist and distorting scripture and God's way of living. Okay, so why are we talking about Pharisees? Because if we can be honest, we're actually, some of us, at times, modern day Pharisees. Because just like the Pharisees, what we tend to do is we create our own rules for how we want to live or how culture says that we should live, right? But when we follow our own rules as modern-day Pharisees, what happens is we actually hold ourselves back from the fullest life that God wants to give us. So we have to be really careful to recognize and not be modern-day Pharisees so that we can live the fullest life that God wants for us. So what does Jesus do? Jesus is unruly. Jesus comes and he breaks all the rules of the Pharisees, right? And as well as breaks all the rules in our life that are holding us back. See, so instead of the guilt and hopelessness and conflict and misery that we experience by following our own rules, Jesus is going to break our rules and offer us peace and belonging and security and purpose and hope. So we need Jesus to come in and break all of these rules that we've put on ourselves. So and here's our big takeaway from the series, and this is what we're going to explore, is that as Christians, it's here, we don't follow the rules. We follow the ruler, King Jesus. See, Christianity, being a Christian, is not about just following a bunch of rules, like from God, like God is there um, on high, and he just has this list of do's and don'ts. Christianity is not about that. It's not just following the rules. We follow Jesus. We follow the ruler, King Jesus. Now, one of the rules that the Pharisees had was the rule of rest. They had a rule around rest and what rest looked like and how you could rest and when to rest. And that's what we're talking about today is the Pharisee rule of rest. And here was the Pharisee rule of rest. I rest from my work. I rest from my work, right? With this idea is we work and we work and we work and we work. And then maybe when we've earned it, we can rest. Right? So, and maybe we know that we're experiencing um, this Pharisee rule of rest, and we know that we're, we're, we're operating out of I rest for my work whenever we start saying things like this. We start saying things like, I'll rest when I'm done. Right? We've never said that before. Right? So we have this to-do list, this massive to-do list um, in our week, and then we start chopping it down, and we start trying to get things done, um, and then what happens? 
We, it's like Wednesday or Thursday. We just add more to our list for the weekend. I see, and then other people will then add more to our list. So then we get to the weekend whenever we think we can rest, and then what happens? Either we exhaust ourselves trying to finish everything, or we feel defeated because we didn't get everything done. So we're operating of I'll rest when I'm done. But here's my question. Are we actually ever done? Is everything on our to-do list ever fully accomplished, right? So then what happens? Well, we said, okay, well, I didn't get to rest this weekend. Maybe next weekend. Okay, may- okay maybe not next weekend. Okay, maybe the weekend after. Okay, fine, I'm fine. I'll, t- I'll rest when I'm on vacation. Fine. So then we go on vacation in order to find rest. But here's my question. Have you ever gone on vacation? Have you ever, like, tr- have you ever gone on vacation very, very few times is it actually restful, right? So I, um, for the last six years before I moved here, you know, I'm originally from the area. I um, grew up here in Houston, but for the last six years, I've been living in Orlando, Florida, the theme, theme park capital of the world, right? I feel bad for people when they say they're going on a Disney vacation because <laughs> you need a master's degree to plan it, Right? If you, and you know this if you've ever gone to Disney recently, right? So because where's the food that we're going to eat? What are all the activities that we're going to do? Am I going to like it? We're trying to plan, trying to organize everything. It's incredibly stressful, right, just so we can have a good time. And then what happens? And we all know this. You come home, and what do we say? I need a vacation for my vacation, <laughs> right? So then, we're, so then we say, okay, well, you know what? If I didn't actually get rest on vacation, then what happens? You know what? I actually don't need that much rest after all. You know, so, you know, college students will say this, teenagers will say this, um, but also for many of us, uh, we are incredibly ambitious and accomplished in our lives and in our careers. See, and we've just gotten used to the grind. We've just gotten used to the work ethic, right? We've just gotten used to the American way, and then we'll say, you know what, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> and this is how we view rest, right, is we're thinking in the way of the Pharisees, we're we act like modern day Pharisees whenever we start saying these things. And just like the Pharisees, we place rules on when we can rest. We've allowed rules to creep in our life so we don't rest at all. But what happens is we feel defeated if we don't get everything done, or we feel exhausted in the process. And that's where many of us find ourselves this morning is we're just exhausted, right? And maybe you even came to an earlier service typically, but even today you came to the later ones so you could sleep in because you're exhausted, right? So for some of us, we may find um, we have young kids at home and it's exhausting. Or, or some of us, you know, we, we're taking our kids to school, rehearsals and practices while trying to do the best we can in our demanding job. Or for some of us, we're in between jobs and applying nonstop. Or we're single and navigating relationships. Or for some of us, we're caring for an aging parent or navigating sons-in-laws or daughters-in-laws or fighting for marriages, and it's exhausting. Or maybe for some of us, we're not experiencing any of these things, but somebody that we deeply care about is, and we just see them, and they're just exhausted, and we don't know how we can help, we don't know what to do, right? And we care for them so deeply. Um, And what modern-day Pharisees do is we place all of these rules on when we can rest and how we can rest, and that just leads to so many of us feeling exhausted and defeated. So the Pharisee rule of rest, this doesn't work. But fortunately, Jesus has a better way for us. Um, Jesus is going to offer us a better way that doesn't result in us feeling defeated and exhausted and actually allows us to rest. So our question for this morning is this, is how does Jesus give me rest from rules? How does Jesus give me rest from from rules. So if you have your Bible, it's going to be in Matthew chapter 12. It'll be on the screens. Pull out your Bibles, Matthew 12. See, and we're going to look at an encounter that Jesus has with the Pharisees in a conversation that they had where they start discussing rules and rest and work. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 12. So you can turn there. And here's the first fill-in is this. Don't let rules rule my rest. Don't let rules rule rule 
my rest. And we're going to see this in action in Matthew chapter 12. We'll start in verse 1. Matthew 12 verse 1 says this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. So here's what's going on. Back in the Old Testament, God had designated a group of people that were going to be his people. And he also said, hey, this is the way that we're going to live. This is the way that we're going to have a relationship, right? And the way, one of the ways that God wanted to have a relationship with his people is he wanted to give them this amazing gift called the Sabbath, And the Sabbath was a 24-hour period of time. And for the Jews, it was Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, a 24-hour period of time where they got to experience this. Stop work, enjoy rest, practice delight, and contemplate God. Isn't this incredible? Doesn't it sound amazing? This free gift from God. Stop work, enjoy rest, practice delight, and contemplate God. See, but in order for them to experience this, they kind of had to set themselves up and guard the Sabbath day so they can do this. So they had to work um, before then to be able to not work on the actual Sabbath. So gathering food was considered work. And so that was normally to be done not on the Sabbath so they could just rest on the Sabbath and not have to work. See, but the Pharisees, instead of allowing this to be a blessing, um, they actually added all of these additional rules that made this a burden, right? So now you have these hungry disciples and they need to eat, and the Pharisees have put all of these extra rules um, preventing the disciples just from being able to eat. See, the Pharisees, they wanted the disciples to rest in their rules and regulations, not according to the purpose of the Sabbath, Right, so um, some months ago, um, I was with a group of people, uh, and there was a group of us hanging out, and uh, with the group, a group of us, there was a married couple, right? So there was a husband and a wife, a young married couple in their 20s. So um, they told us, the sto- in this group setting, they told us the story about what happened the weekend prior. So just a few days before we were all hanging out, um, the husband, t- they are telling us a story about how the husband comes home, and he's tired from work, All right, he just wants to relax. So he wants to kick up his feet up, sit in the recliner, um, but he also wanted the home to feel really restful and peaceful. So what he decided to do was light a candle. So he lights a candle just so the aroma can fill the air, and then he can just feel peaceful and rest and relax. And he also knew that his wife really liked candles. So he was excited for her to be able to come home and walk into a home that just had this candle going um, with the, the smelling really good and feeling really peaceful. So she comes home, she sees him, she sees the house, and she's like, why would you light a candle? And he's like, what do you mean? She says, the house is a mess. We do not light a candle whenever the house is a mess. See, the handle is only lit after everything is already clean. So put your feet down. We need to clean. Clean the kitchen. Let's clean the room. Let's get these floors going. If you want to light a candle, we need to clean before we can light the candle. So the group of us, as we're hearing that story, half of the group said, yes, I believe in the candle lighting rules. Everything she said is true. The other half of the group, mostly the guys, uh, we, had, we had no idea there was candle lighting rules. Like, what do you mean there's like rules before you can light a candle, right? And even some of you as you're listening know exactly what I'm talking about. So I had no idea there was candle lighting rules. I go home and I tell my wife, right? Like, Lauren, did you know there's candle lighting rules? And Lauren's like, yes, Isaac, duh, of course. I'm like, what? She says, Isaac, the candle is the beacon of completion, You don't light a candle unless everything is done, right? So if you want to light a candle, you better not touch the kitchen. Do not unfluff a pillow. Pick your shoes up by the door. The candle means everything is done. Don't mess anything up. So now, uh, we hear this, and some of us, you know, will apply these candle lighting rules that you may and may not practice in your home, which is fine, right? We do in our house. But wait. You hear this, and we'll take this principle of candlelighting rules, and we'll just apply it on everything. 
We create all of these rules for when we can rest and when we can't rest, right? And we just, we shackle ourselves whenever we do that, right? For some of us, we'll use candle lighting rules on every part of our lives. We create rules for when we can rest. But here's what you already know to be true, is that rules don't equal rest. Rules don't equal rest, right? So here's my question for us, is when is your next full rest day? Today, Sunday? Maybe it's, maybe it's today, or maybe it's normally Sunday, so a week from now. When is your next full rest day? Maybe it's Friday, maybe it's Saturday, this coming weekend. Maybe you have more because it's spring break this week. When is your next full rest day? What rules do you have in place that are preventing you from stop work, enjoy rest, practice delight, and contemplate God? In whatever you designate as your next full rest day, are there rules that you have placed in your life that will prevent you from stopping work, enjoy rest, practice delight, and contemplate God? So we'll keep going here. The next fill-in is this. Number two is this. Recognize Jesus has authority over rest. Recognize Jesus has authority over rest. So we'll keep reading. The story continues in verse 3 in Matthew 12. We'll keep reading here. And he answered, this is Jesus talking, and he answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. Verse 8, you can underline this, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Right? See, the Pharisees viewed themselves as experts in Old Testament law. So Jesus is going to use the Old Testament to prove to them how they're wrong, right? So Jesus says, hey, David, remember your King David, that king that you like? Um, do you remember what he did when he was hungry? King David ate. And also, you remember the priests, the high priests? Do you remember what they did whenever they had to do some work on the Sabbath? Um, they did work on the Sabbath, and they were not, um, it was, it was, they were considered guiltless, right? The priests that had to do work on the Sabbath were considered guiltless. So we have king and we have priests, both people with high authority, and in both cases, it's not what, it's who. It's not what is being unruly, it's who is allowed to be unruly, it's not what is being unruly, it's who is allowed to be unruly. And priests and kings are not guilty because of who they are. And Jesus is both our high priest, and Jesus is both, in, as well as our king of kings, and Jesus says in verse 6, hey, look, something greater than the temple is here. See, what Jesus does, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's mind-blowing. Jesus establishes himself equal with God. He says, hey, look, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, right? So he's basically saying, hey, look, Jesus is fully man. He's also fully God. And you say, hey, I'm fully God. And as fully God, I'm actually the creator. Jesus is saying, Jesus actually created the Sabbath in the first place. And because Jesus created the Sabbath, Jesus has authority over the Sabbath. Jesus has authority over our rest. See, but what happens, though, is we don't consider Jesus having authority over our rest as we put ourselves in authority over our rest. And the way that we typically do that is we'll put our to-do list in authority over our rest. And we don't feel like we have permission to rest until our do list gets completely done, right? So we need to be wary when we put ourselves in authority over our rest, right? So Corey Ten Boom once said this. She said, hey, look, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. See, busyness and resting, and not busyness and not resting, here's what it does. And yes, there are certain seasons that are just more full than other seasons. Yes, 100%. But at the core, right, busyness and not resting, here's what it does, is it cuts off our connection to God. It cuts off our connection with other people. 
and it even cuts off the connection to our own soul. So we have to recognize that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of our rest. Jesus has authority over our rest, not our to-do list. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And with his authority over rest, here is what he does. Number three is this. Remember, compassion supersedes everything, including rest. Remember, compassion supersedes everything, including rest. We'll keep reading. The story continues. Verse 9. The story continues in verse 9. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? And underline this part, the second part of verse 12. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So Jesus just finished a conversation with the Pharisees about rest. And the Pharisees, though, they're still trying to trap Jesus. So they encounter this guy who needed healing, and they're trying to trap Jesus and say, hey, look, can you heal this guy? Because if you do, that's work. We don't need to work on the Sabbath. Um, So they wanted to accuse Jesus. But remember, the Sabbath is meant to be a blessing, right? And Jesus saying, hey, a person can still do good works on the Sabbath. So I want you to imagine for a second, it's your rest day. Right? Maybe you have plans this week for a rest day. And on your rest day, um, you are planning to, to, to grill out burgers and have some people over. Or maybe you are packing everything up for a lake day and you're packing up everything to go to the lake. Um, or maybe you're more of an inside person and you want like a movie marathon, right? So you have the jammies on, you have the popcorn going, you just have, you know, your, your series of movies that you're about to binge all day. So whatever your rest day is, like imagine yourself there and you're excited to do it. And then you get a text message. And the text message breaks your heart, completely unexpected. And you know in that moment you're not going to the lake, you're not grilling burgers, you're not watching a movie, you're putting your clothes on that you need to put on to be able to go and meet somebody at the hospital because just, you just found out some bad news. Or you go to take food to somebody who needs it and somebody in your life, small group. Take them food that they need. Or maybe it's your neighbor, and they're in a situation, and you need to go and pick up their kids from practice. Why do we do that? Because like Jesus, we also work with compassion, and we don't let compassion, and compassion supersedes everything, including our rest. So like Jesus, you also do good work with compassion. See, but whenever we forget this, whenever we don't practice this, Here's what happens. We no longer view others as people to look with compassion. You view other people as getting in the way of what we wanted to do, of the work that we need to accomplish. Other people are getting in the way. And Jesus, consistently throughout the New Testament and the Gospels, never views people as getting in the way of what we need to get done. He consistently views people with compassion to love and to serve them. Right? So remember, the Pharisees taught I rest from my work. I rest from my work. It's not a good way to live, right? Jesus offers us a better way. And here's the bottom line for today is I don't rest from my work. I work from my rest. I work from my rest. See, resting in Jesus allows us to work with Jesus. I work for my rest. Rest is our starting place. Rest is not the cherry on top. Rest is not the icing on the cake that maybe we might get to it. Hey, but if I don't get to it, I still get the cake. No, 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 no. Rest is the, the, ta- the, the base, the table that the cake sits on. Rest is our starting place. Rest is not an option. Rest is a priority, right? Rest is our starting place. And then from our starting place of rest, now we can go and we can work with God and we can view others with compassion, right? Um, this is actually set up in Genesis at the very beginning of creation, right? And, you know, in Genesis, um, uh, days one through five, God created the world, created the earth and the, the, the water and the seas and the trees and the grass and all that. And then on day six, God creates our first parents, Adam and Eve, And then what happens on day seven? 
Do you know this? They rest. So imagine this. Human's first day, full day of existence with God is a day of rest. And then they start working with caring for the animals and caring for the garden. But the first full day of human existence is starting from rest, y'all. And this is the gospel. This is the good news is that we don't have to earn it. We don't have to work our way to God. God already did all the work for us in Jesus. So now we can just rest in who Jesus is and what he did. And we can recognize that we need forgiveness. We are sinful, right? We have sin in our lives and Jesus sees that. And despite of our sinfulness, Jesus loves us anyway. Way, that he came and he died for us, right? So because Jesus offers us this free gift, we don't need to earn to work it. Jesus already earned everything for us. We just need to believe in our heart that Jesus rose from the dead. We need to confess Jesus as Lord, yes, of our Sabbath, but also just Lord of our life and receive this free gift. And part of the reason why some of us are going and going and going and going and going and never feel rest is because we've never accepted Jesus in the first place. If you've never received Jesus, now today is a great day to do that, to finally feel rest in your soul from him and offer this free gift of grace where Jesus cleanses you of your sin and forgives you of your sin and offers you a new life in him so that you can have a new life now as well as spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. And if you've never done that before, right, if you've never become a Christian or become a Christ follower, I would love to give you a chance to do that. Jesus did all the work for you. He died on a cross for you because he loves you, and now he wants to give you rest. And if you've never done that before, you can pray a prayer that's in your notes, receiving Jesus into your life, giving you a new heart, having a new life in him, right? You can pray the prayer in your message notes, asking Jesus to come into your life. Okay, so practically, what does that look like? Practically, what does work from rest look like? It's this. It's rest my body and my soul. Rest my body and my soul, right? We need to rest our bodies and we need to rest our souls. Um, you will never feel rested physically if you don't feel rested spiritually. So practically, I want us to consider resting our bodies and our souls in three ways. The first way is this. Bow daily by getting a chair. Bow daily by getting a chair. You need to get still before God daily, right? You, uh, and the way we see it around here, and really Pastor Mike and our leadership team um, do an incredible job leading the way, is you get a chair, uh, find a chair, right? Find a chair where you can sit and be still and hear from God in Scripture and speak back to God in prayer, and you journal the things that come to mind. Part of the reason we're so exhausted is just our minds are nonstop. So journaling allows us to get all of our thoughts out, to be still before God and offer it to him as Lord, right? And if you're able, and many of us are, if you're able, um, we don't need to just sit in the chair, although we can. Here's way more powerful. You kneel at the chair. You bow at the chair, Right? Because at the chair, it's, we're in a posture of a surrenderance and submission to Jesus as Lord over our life, having authority over our life, as well as a reminder of there's not a lot we can get done when we're kneeling at a chair. There's not a lot of work we can do. There's very little to do list that we can, we can do when we're kneeling at a chair. So it's, it's a reminder to ourselves that Jesus is Lord of our Sabbath. We are not Lord of our Sabbath. So we can bow daily by getting a chair, right? So imagine with me, right? You wake up, you smell that coffee, it smells really good. You put on some soul-stirring worship music, you get your Bible, you get your journal, you get a pen, you find your chair, you kneel at it, and then you journal and you read and you pray, right? And then 20 minutes later, now you're getting ready to start your day. That's a really good day. That's working from rest. All right, so the next practical is this. Sabbath weekly by dedicating time for rest and renewal, right? Sabbath weekly by dedicating time for rest and renewal. Uh, uh, one of my mentors, um, he had a boat. This is some years ago. He had a boat, and he invited a group of us to go out on his boat. So we're there. So we meet at this grill um, to have some burgers, Lakeside Grill, have some burgers. Um, and then we get on the boat, and the boat's going, right? And it's loud, and wind's in our face, and then we're trying to like grab our hats to make sure that they don't fall off. And then he stops the boat, turns off the engine, doesn't speak for about 20 seconds, which is a little awkward. <laughs> but then he says, 
There's nothing like the wind in your face that will blow the cobwebs off your soul. And that was a reminder for us to dedicate time for rest and renewal and feel that wind in the face. So then I got home and I'm like, can I buy a boat? No. But, <laughs> but what I was able to do was um, I started electric scootering, right? I love just jumping on an electric scooter. Different experience, I know, but it, it, did, it did the job. Just f- feeling the wind in your face, right? To where, like, I truly, like, and that kind of got made fun of for being, like, the electric scooter guy uh, for a while. But it was so restful for me just to feel that one in the face of having dedicated time for rest and world just to be outside and just to kind of feel God. And the last practical is this, is retreat annually by planning a getaway. Retreat annually by planning a getaway, right? Um, you know, imagine if we are um, bowing daily, And imagine if we are Sabbathing weekly. Now, when we get to an annual getaway, there's not so much pressure on this vacation because we already have these rhythms of rest. So now we go on this getaway and we can just rest and retreat and it's amazing and it's incredible and we're not just recovering the entire time and we actually get a vacation where we don't feel like we need a vacation for our vacation. And I'll I'll close with this. Um, You know, some of us, you know, we've been listening the whole time and if we're honest, uh, you know, you're hearing this and you're just exhausted. And just the season of your life you're in, you're just exhausted, and you're going, and you're going, and you're hearing some of the practicals, and you're like, I just don't know what that can look like. My, me and Isaac, if you knew my life, I just, I just don't know. That's a lot, man. I know, I, I know what you're saying. I know Jesus offers this, but I just don't know. And I would love to close with some encouragement, because Jesus' promises of rest is still true. And Jesus will meet you right where you are. Um, and rest in this season may look different than it did in previous seasons, but because Jesus is Lord of rest, it's enough. So no matter where you may find yourself, my prayer is that we find rest in Jesus. So I'm gonna, I, if you can, close your eyes, and I want to pray the words of Jesus over you, as well as just pray my own words as well. Um, then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus, we sit here before you. I'm just being still before you right now. And right now, God, you are enough, and we are enough in you. So I pray that we can continue to find rest in you, and you will give the grace to find rest, even in the midst of the busiest seasons that we may be in because you're Lord of rest, you are Lord of the Sabbath, and we're going to trust you and submit ourselves to you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.